With that, I want to tr introduce tonight's speaker, Mike Weber. Although Mike is a relatively recent volunteer at the museum, he has a long history and a love of Cornwall. As a child, he collected rock and mineral specimens in and around the waste rock piles, and that led him to the study of geology. As a 1982 geoscience graduate from Penn State, Mike worked for 36 years as a geologist, health physicist, and manager for the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the U.S. Geological Survey. After retiring from federal service, he returned to Cornwall Furnace, where he serves as a guide and researches the history of mining and the geology of Cornwall and similar deposits in Pennsylvania. One of Mike's ongoing research projects is the study of the monthly reports of the Cornwall Division of Bethlehem Steel. This will allow us to have a better understanding of the operation as we hope that this will lead to a publication on the topic. So without any further ado, please welcome our speaker, Mike Weber. Good evening and thanks for joining us for this webinar on Cornwall's prehistory. I appreciate your interest in the topic and I also appreciate the support of Cornwall Iron Furnace Friends for hosting this webinar. These webinars in the Cornwall Lecture Series generally focus on history. For example, the previous two webinars covered the history of blessing stones in Pennsylvania and America in the 1840s. Tonight, we continue this theme, but focus on Cornwall's prehistory, long before Peter Grubb began mining and operating the Cornwall furnace, long before William Penn received the land grant from King Charles II, even long before the Native Americans inhabited the beautiful forests and hills of Cornwall. The earth has a history too, and that history played a significant role in getting Cornwall on the map and setting the stage for human history that followed. By the conclusion of this webinar, I hope that you have a better understanding of Cornwall's prehistory. Although history is scribed on stone tablets, written, illustrated, and photographed, the earth's history is recorded in the rocks. Geology is the study of the earth. Now I recognize that it may have been a few years, if ever, since you've had your last class on geology. So I will begin my presentation tonight with an orientation, emphasizing some of the differences between history and prehistory. And then I'll describe the rocks beneath and near Cornwall, including how they formed and deformed through time. That will set the stage for discussing how the iron ore formed at Cornwall and briefly how miners extracted the iron ore at Cornwall. However, I'll keep that discussion short because after all, tonight's webinar focuses on prehistory rather than history. I'll leave plenty of time at the end of my webinar for answering questions and listening to comments. And other than this slide, the rest of my slides will maximize the use of photos, diagrams, and maps so you can see Cornwall's prehistory. Now, many of us may be somewhat familiar with the three hills where Peter Grubb located iron ore and began mining in 1737. Big Hill, Middle Hill, and Grassy Hill are depicted in this map, prepared in 1873 at the direction of the Cornwall Ore Bank Company. This map is one of the earliest geologic maps of Cornwall. For nearly 150 years before this map was drawn, miners dug into the earth and removed rich iron ore to feed the furnaces in and near Cornwall. The iron ore seemed inexhaustible, so miners paid little attention to how much ore there was or how it formed. However, by the 1870s, the Cornwall Ore Bank Company observed that the quality of the ore was declining and raised a concern about exhausting the ore. Consequently, the company approved drilling five holes in the ground to assess the extent of the ore deposit. This map is based on the results from those five holes and from surface observations. And this exploration took place at about the same time people around the world were beginning to learn more about the earth and ask questions about how the earth formed. Our fundamental knowledge about the Earth grew from this global quest for understanding. Through time, geologists identified several big concepts that are important to understanding the Earth and how rocks formed. First, 
the Earth's prehistory is recorded in rocks. We can use rocks to understand how they formed and, from that understanding, learn more about the history of the Earth. And of course, if we don't have rocks, then we have no record of what happened. This leads to the second concept. Most of the rocks are missing, so that there are lots of gaps in our understanding of the Earth's history. Now, what do I mean that the rocks are missing? The Earth is constantly changing, and these changes remove or alter the rocks. At the land surface, rocks continually erode, erasing part of the history. Below the land surface, the rocks are squeezed, baked, stretched, buried, and melted, again erasing or at least modifying the history recorded in the rocks and imprinting new history. In fact, Geologists estimate that existing rocks capture only a small fraction of the Earth's history. Our third concept is that the time experienced by rocks is much longer and the spatial scales are much larger than humans experience in our lifetimes. For example, it may take a million years or more for sand or mud to become rock, 10,000 times longer than a human lifetime. Over such long periods, objects like rocks that seem hard and unyielding to us may actually flow or bend like toothpaste. Similarly, over long time periods and large distances, huge slabs of rocks 400 miles long and 50 miles wide may slide over other rocks or sediments. Now the last two concepts are simpler and more intuitive. Most sediments, mud, sand, and limey ooze, are deposited in horizontal beds like layers of cake or stacked sheets of paper, as you see in the photo on the right. When the rocks form, they preserve these horizontal beds or strata. Geologists refer to these beds or layers in the rock as bedding. Because the rocks stack up layer upon layer, the youngest sediments and rocks are located closest to the surface. Deeper rocks, therefore, are generally older than the rocks at the surface, except when and where they are not. Got all that? There are more concepts to learn, to be sure, but these are the more important concepts to understand for our webinar tonight. We can apply these concepts in deciphering Cornwall's prehistory. The map you see before you shows the kinds of rocks that we find across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Think of this map like we are orbiting the Earth on the International Space Station looking down on the state. The land has been cleared of soil, sediments, trees, water, crops, and the rest of the clutter that people place on the ground. So we see the rocks that are just below the land surface. To the west, near Pittsburgh, you see large areas colored light and medium blue. These are the relatively flat rocks of the Allegheny Plateau that were mined to produce bituminous coal, petroleum, and natural gas. You cannot see the hills and valleys in this geologic map, just the relatively flat layers of rock. Now, moving east in the middle of the state, uh, right about here, you see dark blue and bright pink colors that are all scrunched up, like a carpet had slid across the floor and is laying in a pile near the state's middle. These colors and patterns represent the rocks that comprise the Appalachian Mountains. The rocks are highly folded or bent, so when you look down on them from space, you see these rather squiggly lines. And just southeast of these lines, you can see a broad pink band right here, and that pink band represents the rocks that underlie the Great Valley. The Great Valley hosts the cities of Lebanon, Allentown, Bethlehem, Harrisburg, Carlisle, and Chambersburg. As we move further southeast, you can see an arc of bright green and red rocks. Right here, extending from the Maryland border over here to the Delaware River, uh, just south of the Delaware Water Gap and Stroudsburg. Cornwall sits right on the northern border of this green and red zone. So let's zoom in to get a closer look at the rocks in this part of the state. By enlarging the southeast portion of the state, we can see the rocks in greater detail. We can see more clearly the lines that mark the boundaries of the counties of Pennsylvania. 
now, of course, we cannot really actually see the county borders from space, but they will help us to navigate the map. We can see the three counties of Lebanon, Berks, and Lancaster. The green and red areas underlie the Furnace Hills in southern Lebanon and Berks counties and northern Lancaster County. The rock at the surface beneath the Furnace Hills is often bright red. Now let's zoom in closer and look in detail at the area inside that blue rectangle. Congratulations, we've arrived in Cornwall. Some of the colors on this geologic map have changed, while others, like the bright green and red, have remained the same. We can now can see more detail in our map, including the land surface that's been superimposed on our geologic map. Notice the green bands of rock toward the bottom portion of the map. These areas are flanked by the bright red bands that we will discuss later. And in the areas between the green and red bands is the Cornwall open pit. You can see it in this dark area right here because those are the dark contour lines of the pit. Near the top of the map, you can see bands of tan, brown, and gray signifying other rocks in these areas. Now, of course, we can remove some of the clutter and detail in this simplified map of the rocks of Cornwall. This map was prepared by Stuart Rees and his colleagues at the Pennsylvania Geologic and Topographic Survey earlier this year. In the middle of the map is a lake that is, of course, colored blue right here that I'm highlighting. And that lake fills the large open pit where mining occurred at Cornwall from 1737 until 1973. Just above the lake, you can see a band that's colored orange-red and is labeled diabase. Don't worry, we'll talk about each of these rocks in more detail. For now, just look at their general orientation in relation to the open pit, miner's village, and other landmarks that you might be familiar with. For example, you see Cornwall Iron Furnace up here near the P for parking, uh, and that actually lies on the diabase. And now above that rock uh, is this Ordovician shale. And below the dye base, you can see a pink band that extends underneath the Blue Lake. That's the Buffalo Springs limestone. That's uh, adjacent to another layer called the Ordovician shale. And then further to the south, you have the Triassic sandstone shale and conglomerate. Uh, you'll note that these layers are offset by this line along the right side of the map. Well, that line is a break in the rock or a fault that was active hundreds of millions of years ago, but it is no longer active. Let's examine these rocks now in more detail, beginning with that small pink band, the Buffalo Springs limestone. As we'll see in a bit, the Buffalo Springs is very important at Cornwall because it played a key role in forming the iron ore. You can see the Buffalo Springs limestone today in the hanging wall or south wall of the open pit. You can also observe it along the rail trail just north of Cornwall Center. These rocks are very old and make up part of a large group of rocks that geologists call the Conococheek group. Geologists often name rocks based on the locations where they were first discovered or studied in detail. In this case, the Conococheek group is named for the Conococheek Creek, which is located near Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. One part of this group of rocks is the Buffalo Springs Formation or the Buffalo Springs Limestone. It was named for the Buffalo Springs that are located just east of Cornwall near the intersection of Distillery Road and Route 419. The Buffalo Springs Formation is a white to pinkish gray massive limestone. Within the limestone, you can also find layers of tan to light gray dolomite. Limestone is a sedimentary rock rich in calcium that form from the aggregation of tiny shells of animals that lived in the oceans. These shells accumulated over millions of years, forming a limey ooze in the ocean. Dolomite is a similar sedimentary rock, but it contains more mud and magnesium than the limestone. This is all part of the prehistory recorded in the rock. Based on a variety of indications, geologists think that the Buffalo Springs limestone was deposited about 500 million years ago. 
after the sediments became rock, the Buffalo Springs limestone was folded and faulted. So the limestone is very deformed near Cornwall. As you can see in these photos, particularly this one, see how these lines are all squiggly? Those lines should be flat and straight, nice. So the beds are heavily folded and the dolomite layers uh, within the limestone are somewhat less deformed than the limestone itself. So how did the Buffalo Springs limestone form? From the observations of the Buffalo Springs limestone, geologists think that the limey ooze accumulated in a shallow ocean similar to the hot, shallow oceans today that lie off the coast of Australia. In this environment, algae form shallow mats at and just below the surface of the water. The algal mats can be seen in the photo on the right over here. As the waves wash over these mats, they deposit mud rich in calcium carbonate, forcing the algae to grow upward through the mud to maintain access to the sunlight. And as this process repeats over and over and over again, the algae trap the limey ooze. You can see the remnants of this process in the picture of the rock at the bottom of the screen. Occasionally, rough seas and storms wash over the shallow lagoons and deposit more mud, which dries out in the hot sun and forms layers that are richer in magnesium. Over hundreds of thousands to millions of years, the sediments rich in calcium and magnesium accumulated were buried and formed the Buffalo Springs limestone at Cornwall. The Mill Hill Slate is another one of the older sedimentary rocks found at Cornwall. The Mill Hill Slate is depicted in the simplified map of Cornwall by the pink-purple band adjacent to the Buffalo Springs limestone, located south and southeast of the open pit. The Mill Hill Slate is a light brown to black slate. Unlike the Buffalo Springs limestone that was deposited in fairly shallow water, the sediments that formed the Mill Hill Slate were deposited in deep trenches at the edge of the continental shelf. The diagram on the right illustrates how the mud and the clay sediments accumulated off the continental shelf in these deep trenches and submarine canyons. The Mill Hill Slate is only found at Cornwall, where it was metamorphosed by the deep burial and exposure to intense heat from the dye base located nearby. And you can see that in the rocks here. This is the Mill Hill Slate after it's been uh, metamorphosed by that intense heat. Like the Buffalo Springs limestone, it too is highly deformed. In fact, this rock may have been depo deposited far to the east and then slid across other rocks as the original Atlantic Ocean closed. More about that in a bit. The intense deformation and potential transport hundreds of miles is associated even more strongly with the next rock, the Blue Conglomerate. The Blue Conglomerate is also only found at Cornwall and is likely part of the same formation as the Mill Hill Slate. When first discovered, the Blue Conglomerate was considered a geologic mystery because of its unusual features. The rock contains clasts or chunks of quartz and limestone ranging in size from sand grains to boulders, all located in a bed of clay. You can see that the clasts, or those chunks, are sharp, not rounded, like they would be in a more typical conglomerate. Today, geologists consider the blue conglomerate a tectonic breccia, or a wildflisch, that formed by grinding underneath giant slabs of rock that slid for tens to hundreds of miles like the Mill Hill Slate, the Blue Conglomerate was metamorphosed near Cornwall, especially close to the diabase. Near the contact with the diabase and close to the Cornwall ore, the clasts in the Blue Conglomerate have been replaced by other minerals, like you see in this photograph. There is a lot of history both recorded and lost in the Blue Conglomerate. Now, each of these older sedimentary rocks that we've been discussing has been highly deformed. How did that happen? The history of deformation of the rocks is summarized in this sequence of illustrations, which covers the last 600 million years or so of southeastern Pennsylvania. Don't blink or you may lose 100 million years. Between 60 and 450 million years ago, as illustrated in A, sediments collected in a shallow sea on the eastern seaboard of North America. 
In diagram B, that early sea began to close and mountains rose to the east from about 450 to 350 million years ago due to compression of the sediments and the rocks as plates moved together. The compression intensified in diagram C between 325 and 265 million years ago, squeezing the rocks caused them to bend or fold and crack or fault while the Alleghenian highlands formed to the west. In diagram D at the top over here, between 225 and 200 million years ago, the squeezing subsided and instead of squeezing, the Earth's crust was pulled apart in this area, forming deep basins at the base of mountains that you see on the right-hand side of this illustration. And keep that in mind because we're going to talk about that in the next slide. And finally, in the last diagram E, we fast forward to the present as erosion removed tens of thousands of feet of rock from the surface and washed the sediment into today's Atlantic Ocean to our east. As we saw in the geologic maps of Pennsylvania, that large arc colored green and red extended from the Maryland border to the Delaware River. The rocks represented by that green band are younger sedimentary rocks called the Hammer Creek Formation near Cornwall. And these rocks were deposited in deep basins that we saw in the previous slide. The Hammer Creek Formation is made up of red sandstones, shales, and conglomerates. The red color of the rock is caused by the presence of iron oxide or hematite. That uh, mineral was deposited along with sand, mud, silt, and pebbles that eventually formed the Hammer Creek Formation between 250 and 200 million years ago. The streams carried the mud, sand, silt, and pebbles down from high mountains and co uh, collected in large basins or series of basins at the base of the mountains. The sediments accumulated in stream channels alluvial fans, and shallow lakes in the basins so rapidly that the iron remained oxidized, imparting that characteristic red color. In some places, raindrop imprints, which you can see in this uh, shale exposure here, mud cracks, and dinosaur tracks help confirm the environments in which the sediments accumulated. More recently, of course, People have used these red rocks as building stones in houses, farms, mills, and many of the historical buildings right here in Cornwall, including the furnace seen here, as well as the coal house, miners' homes, stables, wagon shop, blacksmith shop, churches, and the manor barn. The stretching of the crust that formed the deep basins also thinned the crust and cracked the rock sufficiently to allow molten rock or magma to intrude into the rocks around Cornwall. The magma formed diabase, or trap rock as it's called, when it cooled within the older sedimentary rocks. Diabase is an intrusive, fine-grained, igneous rock that contains the minerals plagioclase, feldspar, and pyroxenes. You may have already observed the diabase and rounded boulders along the sides of the Pennsylvania Turnpike near Morgantown and Cornwall or on the battlefield at Gettysburg at places like Devil's Den, pictured here, and Cemetery Ridge. Diabase is a hard rock and is generally resistant to erosion, especially when compared with the softer sedimentary rocks that surround it. The diabase baked and metamorphosed the adjacent rocks, including the Buffalo Springs limestone, the Mill Hill Slate, the Blue Conglomerate, and the Hammer Creek Formation at Cornwall. The geologic maps that we've been looking at uh, so far have been aerial views as though we're looking down on the earth from above. To see what lies beneath the uppermost rocks, geologists draw cross sections or vertical slices of the rock beneath the surface as seen in this diagram. This cross section is a slice through the rocks near the open pit. The diabase is depicted in red, which you can see right here. And you can see how the diabase intruded into the sedimentary rocks at Cornwall. Note especially the areas where the Buffalo Springs limestone, this tan colored rock, is in close contact above the diabase. The black rocks, which you see shaded here beneath the Buffalo Springs, are remnants of the iron ore after nearly 200 years of surface and underground mining. Now, 
I'm sure you've recognized by now that the lettering in this cross section appears backwards because you're actually looking at the cross section like you would view the rocks in the open pit from the overlook on Boyd Street. The Buffalo Springs limestone is exposed in the south wall or the left wall of the pit and the diabase is exposed on the north or the right wall. You can see that exposure now on the right wall of the pit in this photograph. The miners called the diabase trap rock, uh, which you can see here. Trap rock was strong and would often ring when struck by a pick or a drill. The ore was removed from on top of the trap rock, which constituted the foot wall of the pit on the right side of the photograph. It's called a foot wall because you can actually stand on it. The limestone on the other side of the pit rested on top of the ore and made up the hanging wall of the pit on the left side of this photo. Now, as the miners excavated iron ore at Cornwall, they noticed a peculiar relationship between the ore and the limestone adjacent. In many locations, the ore exhibited the same bedding or parallel layers as the limestone itself. In fact, miners could often trace the bedding in the ore continuously into the bedding in the limestone. Some beds in the limestone were replaced by iron ore or magnetite, whereas other beds contained different minerals and relatively little ore. This provided an early clue to the formation of the ore from the limestone. Now you can see the bedding in the photo here and in this illustration of a piece of iron ore from Cornwall on the right side of the slide. On the left, you see pictures of the ore here and here. And you'll note below this pick right here, there's actually a small piece of ore that rests directly on the diabase. And inside that ore, you can see the original bedding of the limestone that was replaced to form the iron ore. Beginning in the 1870s, geologists started investigating how the ore Cornwall formed. This investigation had both scientific and practical benefits. The practical benefits provided opportunities to discover more ore deposits. For example, this was achieved at Cornwall with the discovery of a buried ore deposit in 1919, about a mile east of the open pit. Discovery of additional ore was predicted by a geologist from the U.S. Geological Survey in 1908. Geologists discovered a similar underground ore body near Morgantown, Pennsylvania, and began developing the ore there in the 1950s. But a detailed understanding of just how the ore formed at Cornwall required about a hundred years of study, and not just at Cornwall, but at mines and at laboratories around the world. Besides geology, detailed knowledge of chemistry and thermodynamics were needed. Oyster and Chow published a paper in 1979 that offered a plausible explanation for how the ore formed at Cornwall. Without getting into too many of the details of this presentation, the explanation relies on the heat that was released by the cooling diabase along with chemical reactions in three different zones. The heat given off by the diabase drives the groundwater to flow from one zone to another. In this picture, the diabase is again illustrated by this red band. So we start our process below the diabase where the hot groundwater dissolves minerals like uh, quartz and mica. And then it flows up through the dolomite and into rocks above the dolomite into zone two where that same groundwater now dissolves iron. And as the flow continues through to zone three over here, uh, and the water cools somewhat, the groundwater replaces the limestone and dolomite in the Buffalo Springs limestone with magnetite using the iron that was scavenged from the nearby bedrock. The solution then returns from zone three back to zone one, and the cycle begins again. This cycle continued for millions of years until the heat dissipated or the chemistry changed significantly and stopped additional deposition of iron ore. In the sandstone pictured on the left, you can see this bleached zone right here, which may represent how the iron was uh, dissolved and removed in zone two from this uh, chemical model. Now we can see examples of the ore in this slide. 
The photo on the right shows a miner. You can see the miner standing right here with overalls on and a hard hat, uh, looking at the ore in an open stope in one of the underground mines at Cornwall. The middle photo shows a piece of ore that was mined close to the surface. Over tens of thousands of years, weathering removed some of the weaker minerals present in the ore, resulting in a higher iron concentration in the ore. And then the photo on the left, you see magnificent crystals of magnetite that were found in the underground mines at Cornwall. The two inch pocket knife in the lower left hand corner is included as a scale. These are some of the finest examples of magnetite crystals in the world, and they come from Cornwall. In addition to magnetite, the ore deposit at Cornwall yielded about 100 different minerals, which have been prized by mineral collectors since the 18th century. Just like how the rocks record the history of the earth, the minerals found in the ore deposits record the sequence of how the minerals formed in the ore. You can think of the slide or the diagram that you see as a timeline going from left to right. The first minerals formed uh, are the oldest and they're the ones located on the left of the diagram, whereas the younger minerals formed or the minerals that formed last are located on the right side of the diagram. So the first minerals deposited were common minerals like quartz and calcite and feldspar. The next minerals to form included the iron sulfide mineral pyrite, along with micas and the amphibole actinolite. The next phase of mineralization was key at Cornwall because the bulk of the ore formed during this phase, and that included the formation of magnetite, pyrite, and chalcopyrite. And then came the final phase of mineral formation, which included chlorite and hydrated silicate minerals like zeolites. You can see a variety of these minerals in this slide. On the left are those magnificent magnetite crystals that you've already seen. Next, you see pyrite crystals on stilbite, one of the zeolites that I just mentioned that was a favorite of miners and mineral collectors at Cornwall. In the middle, you can see malachite with its distinctive copper green color. Proceeding to the right is a specimen of native copper or copper in its elemental form. Native copper was found and mined for many years in the upper portion of the ore at Middle Hill. However, by the beginning of the 20th century, native copper became very rare as the miners continued to dig deeper into the deposit. And finally, the specimen on the far right is chalcopyrite. Magnetite, pyrite, and chalcopyrite were the primary minerals mined at Cornwall for over 230 years. In fact, the chalcopyrite contained trace yet economical quantities of gold and silver, along with copper and iron. And these minerals uh, contributed greatly to the overall value of the ore at Cornwall. As we transition now from prehistory back into history, kind of our existence, mining of the ore deposit began in shallow trenches in the pits in 1737 on the surface of Big Hill. Eventually, the pits merged into larger and larger excavations beneath Big Hill, Middle Hill, and Grassy Hill. Although surface mining was suspended in the open pit in 1953, it resumed in the pit in 1964 and finally came to a conclusion at Cornwall in 1973. Although much of the 106 million tons of iron ore produced by the mines at Cornwall came from the open pit, miners also excavated ore from underground mines located beneath the pit and about a mile east of the open pit. The number three mine was constructed beneath the pit where the ore continued about 300 feet deeper than could be mined economically from the surface. Construction of this mine began in 1921 and closed down after flooding occurred in 1972. The ore body to the east was mined by the number four mine, which began in 1924, was suspended for several years due to the Great Depression, and then resumed mining in 1937. Like the number three mine, mining in the number four mine ceased after flooding in 1972. As I bring this uh, formal part of the presentation to a close, I'd like to thank the people who made it all possible. First, thanks to the Cornwall Furnace Friends for sponsoring this webinar. Second, I'd like to thank Mike Emery, Cornwall Site Administrator, and Karen Viozzi for the enthusiasm, 
dedication, and leadership. Third, I significantly appreciate the professionalism and determination demonstrated by the geologists of the Pennsylvania Geologic and Topographic Survey, particularly Davis Lapham and Carlisle Gray, who studied and documented the geology of Cornwall for decades, and for one of their successors, Stuart Reese, who I had the pleasure of working with to recognize Cornwall as an outstanding geologic feature of Pennsylvania. Next, I thank Charlie and Jean Neal, along with Mike Trump, who rescued and preserved a treasure trove of information about the mining of Cornwall. And finally, we collectively owe a debt of gratitude to the miners, millers, their wives, and families for their labors and sacrifices over 236 years. Without them, our history of Cornwall would be quite limited, and our understanding of Cornwall's prehistory would be greatly diminished. Thanks for listening, and I'd be happy to answer your questions or listen to any of your comments. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, that was a great presentation. I know I certainly learned quite a bit uh, about, uh, about what we have here, and, and I know that you've tried to tell this to me several times, and, and my uh, my history brain doesn't quite take all of the science the way that it did when I was younger, but certainly having uh, all of the uh, your explanations along with the illustrations really went a long way in, in allowing me to, uh, to understand it. But also I think the, the thing that I really got out of it was the appreciation of the amount of time that we're looking at which took to make this formation. I think a lot of people uh, think that, you know, it's like one large volcanic eruption or, or some, a magma coming up out of the ground and all of a sudden we had this iron. But no, it's this, this long, long, long process of, of, you know, hot liquids that are coming through and, and taking things out of the rock. So uh, that's, that's just a really great way of explaining it and really did appreciate it. Uh, is I'm looking right now in the chat. I see lots of people uh, giving you accolades. I see lots of people saying thank you. Uh, but at the moment, I don't see any questions. So I, I think you you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any closing thoughts, uh, Mike? Or uh, the geology, not only here in Cornwall, but across the Commonwealth, is uh, simply spectacular. So I really hope that, if anything, my presentation tonight perhaps stimulated your interest a little bit more in, you know, those rocks that you'd zoom by on the interstate highways and on the turnpike, and even the roads that you find in your own backyards, or the rocks that you find in your own backyards. Uh, in part, our history is rich because Pennsylvania has been blessed with uh, so many uh, rocks and minerals here at, uh, in Pennsylvania. And that led to a lot of history in developing those mineral resources and uh, led to creating the great uh, state and country that we are today. Well, Mike, we actually did have a bunch of questions just come in just as you were speaking. So uh, Mike Freeland has said, you know, not yet. We're not ending things yet. Uh, he wants to know, do you know why diabase rings? Uh, it is a very dense rock uh, in most cases, especially when it's not uh, weathered. And so it easily transmits uh, the shock waves and that leads to the ringing phenomenon. Uh, other rocks also will ring, uh, but it's a combination of the density and the, the minerals that uh, comprise the rock. Okay, thank you. Uh, Julie Bowman asked, how large was the ore deposit? And then also a follow-up, largest in the USA? And with a <laughs> Uh, well, as I mentioned, uh, all told, the estimate is that they were able to produce 106 million tons of iron ore uh, over the 236 years that the uh, mines operated at Cornwall. 
the open pit is just under a mile long and uh, was dug to a depth of about 450 feet plus or minus. Uh, so that gives you some idea of that size. The uh, other ore body that was mined in the number four mine, as I recall, was about 130 acres as expressed at the land surface. But of course, the ore deposit went from 150 feet down to about 1,200 feet depth. And at its maximum was about 200 feet wide. So that gives you some uh, estimate of the size. It was not the largest in the United States. The uh, mine at Cornwall was the largest until the 1880s. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then after that, uh, the mining in the Misabi Range in the uh, Lake Superior region uh, kind of took over. And then since then, there have been larger mines uh, further to the west. But uh, at least for a long time, it was one of the largest mines, if not the largest mines uh, in the United States. Uh, another question that we have here uh, from John. It says, I assume most of the iron ore has been mined. Are there areas in Cornwall or other areas like Morgantown where one can go see iron ore? Uh, in fact, uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, so they got a lot of the iron out of Cornwall, but they didn't get all the iron out of Cornwall. And in fact, just by walking along Boyd Street, if you look at the hill that leads up to Big Hill, uh, you can actually see some of that original iron ore that was uh, first so attractive to Peter Grubb in his development of uh, this area as the mine. Uh, Less so at, at uh, the Grace Mine in Morgantown. Uh, that mine was entirely below ground, and so uh, it's hard to go there today and see anything. Uh, but you still can see some of the, the original ore that uh, made Cornwall so attractive. Another question that came in, was there any ore left? I'm assuming that means here at Cornwall for the future. So uh, how much was left when operation uh, stopped in 1973? Yeah, that's a difficult question. Uh, the Bethlehem Steel Corporation who decided to cease mining underground uh, certainly kept a close track on how much ore remained in both the number three mine and the number four mine. Uh, of course, if you're familiar with mining, you should be also aware that you sometimes get more ore out of the ground than you expected, and other times you get less ore out of the ground. Uh, so a precise estimate of how much is left is difficult to determine. Uh, we do know that there is ore that remains in both underground mines, and there's ore that remains in the deepest part of the uh, open pit. And even to this day, Cornwall remains a strategic stockpile location for cobalt that remains in those residual ores that are still here uh, if there was a pressing need to develop that cobalt at some point in the future. Uh, another question, and, and I know, Mike, this was uh, a topic that we've also discussed at doing as a future talk. So. Uh, Brett wants to know, how do the workers at Cornwall separate gold and silver from the ore? Which I think is a common misconception. Yeah, so uh, one of the benefits, and I'll try to keep this an answer short <laughs> uh, because it could be rather lengthy, but one of the benefits of their realization here at Cornwall that the ore grade or the percentage of iron in the ore was decreasing uh, uh, caused was the recognition that they would have to somehow enhance the concentration of iron to make continued use of that iron in furnaces uh, profitable. And so they had to grind the iron ore to make it finer so they could use magnetic separation. Well, once they ground the iron ore, then they learned that they could process it both physically and chemically to extract uh, the, uh, uh, first of all, produce a copper concentrate 
And then that copper concentrate could be shipped off-site from the concentrator plant. Uh, and then uh, the gold and the silver could be extracted from that copper concentrate. So here at Cornwall, they didn't actually produce the gold and the silver, but they produced a copper concentrate that was then shipped off to other sites. And that's where they did additional chemical and physical processing to recover the gold and the silver. Uh, the concentrator uh, for the Cornwall site was first located in Lebanon. And then in 1962, a new concentrator plant opened here in Cornwall, uh, which operated for the remainder of the years of mining uh, until 73. It opened briefly after the mines were closed to process some foreign ores, uh, but the whole operation was shut down uh, before the late 70s uh, here in Cornwall. Another question uh, from Kelly. Do the rocks found on Governor Dick relate to the formations that you discussed? Uh, I believe they do. Uh, so those red rocks are also the same rocks of the Hammer Creek Formation. And you may also find that uh, there are uh, pieces of diabase uh, located nearby because it's part of that same Furnace Hills uh, chain I haven't been to Governor Dick for a couple decades, so maybe I'll have to go back there and check it out. <laughs> Another question here, uh, what were the malachite crystals used for? Malachite crystals? Yes, that's, that's what we have here. I, I so uh, the malachite is uh, copper carbonate, and so it would be an ore of uh, copper. Uh, they did ship uh, malachite we have records of uh, as an ore of copper along with the native copper and oxides of copper like cuprite. Um, malachite in and of itself is not typically uh, very attractive as an ore of copper because the copper concentrations tended to be lower. Uh, but if it's used here at Cornwall in conjunction with the other copper minerals, then it was uh, profitably mined. All right. Uh, another question here. Where in the world, including the U.S., is there active iron ore mining? Uh, well, a good question. And of course, that shifts as the price of iron goes up and down. Uh, iron, like uh, many other minerals, is prone to a boom and bust cycle. So if the economy is doing well and there's a high demand for iron, uh, then uh, that drives more exploration, more development, and more mining. If the price goes down, then uh, the desire to pursue uh, creating new mines uh, to produce the iron uh, decreases. Um, most of the iron in the United States today is recycled, uh, and that's a good thing. So both the iron and the steel, uh, I don't have the current numbers, but the, as of the last couple of decades, we've been in the 60 to 70% range of recycled recovered uh, steel and iron. Um, there are active iron mines uh, in the world. Uh, there's still some iron mining that goes on in New York State. Um, there's uh, some um, iron mining that goes on in South America, in Africa, in China, in Russia. So that just gives you an idea, you know, there's a heavy demand still for iron and uh, that's what prompts the uh, continued interest in mining. Okay. Uh, so Bruce asks, what is the likelihood of other ore deposits still in the hills of South Mountain? Uh, low. <laughs> okay. And I say that uh, kind of in jest, but uh, you might find small deposits, but uh, any desire to mine them uh, would not be very high because you'd need a large enough deposit of high enough grade ore to warrant the capital investment and the developmental cost to uh, develop and then mine the ore. And that it can be quite sizable. Uh, during the uh, Second World War, during the Korean War, and several times since, there have been large 
uh, surveys of this area in particular and uh, other nearby areas like around Boyertown, Pennsylvania uh, to specifically to try to identify are there additional iron uh, deposits out there associated with the Triassic Basin that we've been talking about. And uh, there are some anomalies, uh, but not enough that warranted development by a mining company. Okay. I know uh, that kind of covers another question that we had gotten from Jess or Jesse here, uh, asking about was you know, the, the situation that formed the iron ore here, uh, asking if that was a, a relatively rare occurrence, that that's not something that, you know, it, that this was kind of a special thing that was here at Cornwall and, and not something you would find other places. You needed all of these different, you know, rocks that were there in order to have this form. Mm -hmm. It's a, true. Uh, there is, <clears throat> Cornwall was a significant deposit, so it created its own type locality for this kind of an iron ore. Uh, there are other Cornwall type deposits uh, around that band that of green and red rocks that we were talking about. Uh, so you can find them outside of Dillsburg in York County. You can find them near Boyertown, uh, French Creek, uh, Morgantown. Those are all Cornwall-type deposits of iron ore, uh, where the ore is in a close situation with the diabase. Um, and then there are similar deposits that have been located in other parts of the world. A lot of other things here, people. Uh, how rich was the iron ore? Uh, when the mining first began, oh, I'm sorry, were you still talking? Nope, that, that was it. Okay. When mining first began, the concentration of iron here at Cornwall in the ore was in the range of 60 to 65 percent. Uh, that quickly declined as the miners dug deeper. And um, uh, so that this concern I talked about in the 1870s that prompted the review of how to concentrate the iron ore uh, started because the iron ore concentrations had dropped to below 45%. And at that point, they could no longer feed the iron ore without having concentrated it directly into the, corn, the, uh, the cold blast charcoal furnaces. So um, uh, that's what really drove that desire to further concentrate using magnetic concentration. Uh, so up the grade of the ore to make it profitable to use in furnaces, both cold blast and then hot blast furnaces. Uh, Mike Freeland had a, a follow up on the, uh, the ringing of rocks. And it says, on the ringing, it can be made to stop ringing by removing an internal stress imposed by that spherical weathering expansion of exposed boulders. That probably wasn't too clear. So. <laughs> uh, no, I got it. I got it. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> no, no, that's, that was him saying that. That wasn't me saying <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's impressive. I could have said I said it, but you wouldn't have believed it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, let me see, what else? Uh, there was also a question, Mike, uh, someone had asked about if there are ever tours given of what you can see here as far as the mine. Well, maybe you should feel that one. Okay, well, I've, uh, that was something that we, that we tried to do uh, last year, uh, particularly in our Christmas program where we did it in, in a real... Uh, kind of a, a larger way, we had uh, both a, a wagon and also a, a bus in which we were taking people between the furnace and uh, Miner's Village. And while we were going through, we were you know, showing the different buildings on the landscape, but also the features, pointing out where things were uh, for the mine. And at times, uh, Mike has also given tours uh, of the features of the mine. Uh, hopefully when the world re returns to normal again, we'll be able to do some more of that uh, because it is uh, a great 
uh, resource that's adjacent to the site. And uh, of course, a lot of people have questions about uh, not only the 18th and the 19th century operations, which we're able to show here at the furnace, but also the 20th century operation, which is very visible on the landscape still today. The, uh, the mines are on private property, so I would just caution uh, people who might get really enthusiastic about that, that uh, you really should contact the owners of the property and get permission to access them. So if we were ever to do something like that at Cornwall Furnace, we would have to make similar arrangements uh, before we could start giving tours or something like that. It, the benefit of what we did at the Christmas program was by using right-of-ways on public roads. And you drive on Boyd Street right by Big Hill on one side and the open pit on the other side. And so it's just a, an outstanding geologic feature uh, right here in Pennsylvania, right here in Cornwall. A lot easier to see during the winter because of the foliage. Uh, right now it's still a little tough, but in you know a month or two it will be quite easier to see. Right. Um, the foliage and the lantern flies. No, oh, and the lantern flies, yes, the swarms. So uh, Mike Freeland, another follow-up. Uh, he says, great presentation, by the way. What intrigues me is that some of the minerals at Cornwall are unique in the world. Has anyone studied the reasons for that? Hmm. I'm not sure that the uh, minerals are that unique. Uh, Davis Lapham and Carlisle Gray spent the better part of their careers while working at the U uh, Pennsylvania Geologic and Topographic Survey trying to understand how the ore deposits formed and uh, explaining in detail the chemistry of those uh, minerals. Um, and there are still some geologic mysteries here uh, that remain to be resolved. So that's why geology continues as a, an active science. Uh, those magnetite crystals that I referred to are just, in my view, magnificent. I, I told Mike Emery and uh, Karen that uh, those are really Smithsonian grade specimens and we're very fortunate to have those specimens here at Cornwall so that the public can benefit by viewing them uh, and seeing them in all their glory. And Karen now includes that whenever she points that out, that that is a Smithsonian grade uh, <laughs> sample that we have here on site. So yeah. we, we thank you for that education for our staff. Uh, I, we're coming up right now on eight o'clock. One follow-up question here, uh, and this is from Peggy. Uh, are any colleges, universities incorporating any of these webinars or web webinars, as she puts, uh, in their uh, curriculum? Uh, not to my knowledge. <laughs> the year is still young, so we, we can we can get on yeah. that. So. Yeah. Anyway, Mike. Again, I'd like to thank you for the presentation. I'd like to thank everyone who joined. Uh, there are a few questions we didn't get to. Uh, at some point, if you, you want further uh, uh, analysis or answers to that, uh, please go ahead and, and just email the site and I can get that over to Mike. Uh, so thank you for joining the lecture. I especially want to thank Mike Weber for his presentation and for Kathy Donaldson for helping to organize our virtual talk. I also want to thank the friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace who sponsored this program. If you or your business would like to sponsor a future lecture, please contact the site for further information. Of course, donations are gladly accepted. Our next lecture is scheduled for October 13th, which will be Roads, Canals, and Trains by Craig Benner of the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania. Uh, look for that uh, as a Facebook event, and also we will have that up on our, uh, our website uh, events as well. And uh, same format, it will be uh, a Zoom, uh, webinar, sign up ahead of time, and, uh, and Craig's going to, I'm sure, give a, a wonderful presentation as well. So uh, we certainly do look forward to the day when you all can visit the museum again. And in the meantime, please stay safe and good night. So take care, everyone.